Hi, welcome to this online lecture on the surveillance system of detection of exotic new or emerging diseases, which has been de developed under the Risk Sir project. This lecture focuses on the early detection of infection and is illustrated by current examples. My name is Marta Martinez Aviles. I work as a senior research epidemiologist at the Veterinary Surveillance Research Center, PISABET, located at the Complutense University of Madrid in Spain that holds the OA Reference Laboratory for African Swine Fever and African Horse Sickness. For the last 10 years, I have been applying research to the risk-based surveillance and control of infectious diseases for several animal health international institutes, including the OIE. Thank you for joining uh, in this lecture, and I hope you enjoy it. So, the presentation is structured as follows. We will first briefly review the objectives of early detection, then we will continue um, exploring when early detection is best applied, if, it's, if it is applicable to all diseases or to all populations. We will then look at the characteristics that make early detection particularly suitable for certain diseases and health situations. And we will review the basic elements of a surveillance for early detection and what delays the detection of exotic new or emerging diseases. The presentation then finishes with some suggestions to improve early detection design, as well as evaluation based on current examples. So what are the objectives of early detection? The main objective of early detection is to predict the infection of the disease behavior in space and in time. So in order to enable a quick response to control or eradicate before the disease or the infection becomes widespread, which uh, occurs ideally before or at the onset of the occurrence of the negative consequences, which could be, for example, the clinical manifestation of the disease or a decrease in production. Early detection systems are more applicable to certain diseases rather than others. For example, blue tongue is a vector-borne disease of ruminants and the onset of the transmission season can be predicted through the increase in vector population, which can also be predicted by analyzing climatic and environmental data to which the vector population is susceptible to. The confirmation of gluten virus can be done by detecting the pathogen or the antibodies in a previously native population, whether with or without clinical signs. However, rabies or bovine spongiform encephalopathy, BSE, are more difficult to predict, particularly since the confirmation of the disease in animals is only at the post-mortem stage. Still, given their zoonotic nature, a detection of these in animals is considered to be an early detection for humans, since actions can be taken to minimize the risk of a human becoming infected when an animal is found positive to them. Another disease which is very commonly um, used for early detection, sometimes is mentioned, is tuberculosis, for, particularly for those countries that have achieved freedom from disease. However, tuberculosis is a chronic disease, so the earliest it can be detected is through identifying the host's immune response system. So by then, what probably happens is that when a case is detected, the infection is probably widespread to other animals. So tuberculosis follows best the approach uh, for a case detection surveillance, rather than for an early detection surveillance. Although the methodology based on risk factors to accelerate this case detection is very, very similar to early detection, there is a philosophical approach that is different here. So through these examples, we have seen the importance of infection dynamics in the early detection of disease. Now, to start off to describe when an early detection system is best applied, we will go over uh, the characteristics of a, a disease that is very, very contagious. What makes a disease very, very contagious? First of all, um, when an animal is infected, a very contagious disease manages to escape the immune response system of this host, either by uh, multiplying quicker than the uh, antibody response of the animal or employing, employing uh, hiding mechanisms from this uh, immune response system. Next, um, it goes very quickly, 
very fast to the infectious state, so to the state where the animal becomes spreading the pathogen. Also, what makes a very contagious disease is that it can be excreted through many routes. For example, I have listed here um, many typical routes that are involved in, in pathogen excretion through feces, urine, saliva, semen, meat and organ, skin, blood and blood contaminated products. The excretion could be in high quantity that makes it more contagious and it can remain infective for a very long time. Also, a very contagious disease reaches the target organ where it multiplies in the susceptible animal very easily, restarting the cycle. So early detection systems are best applied to very contagious diseases, are particularly suited for this kind, for diseases that have these characteristics. Examples of very contagious diseases are, for example, African swine fever, classical swine fever, avian influenza, foot and mouth disease, but there are many others. Normally, um, very contagious diseases also have severe and irreversible consequences if they are not detected early. That's why they are so suited and uh, that's why early detection systems apply best to these kind of diseases. And they can end up in a high percentage of mortality um, and they are having a very high impact on the trade, on the trade uh, of the country and also on the life so okay, health of the country. That is why uh, this type of diseases are, um, I mean, all of the early detection um, uh, surveillance where, where early detection surveillance systems apply are notifiable to the OIE, the World Animal uh, Health Organization. Another characteristics of diseases where early detection is best applied to are those where um, control is very difficult to apply either because it involves a vector population or because it involves a wild animal reservoir. I have um, illustrated this with the example also of the uh, worst scenario for African swine fever, where uh, there could be transmission between uh, a vector and the domestic population, also transmission between domestic population, Transmission between wild uh, populations and the vector, transmission between wild uh, populations, and transmission between wild and domestic populations. Now, the uh, opportunities to control here um, for any disease, if we looked at it generally, would be um, to apply biosecurity and movement control, to apply drugs to prevent disease, to apply vaccines to prevent transmission, or to apply, apply vaccines to prevent infection. Now for African swine fever, our only tool at the moment is biosecurity and movement control. That is why early detection is so important for this disease, because currently there are no vaccines to prevent either infection or transmission, and there is no treatment either um, that can be applied to control the disease. Also, there could be vector control, which uh, uh, could be important for some diseases. In the case of African swine fever, vectors play mainly a maintenance role rather than a spread role. Ultimately, early detection systems are aimed to detect change, whether this change happens in the environment, in the pathogens, or in the hosts. We want to detect change in the disease spread patterns. So it is um, following the One Health philosophy and movements that have become so popular in the last years. That is why early detection systems are also applied to zoonotic diseases uh, because they constitute an early detection for the humans, for the human beings, even if the actual characteristics in the animal reservoir may not be the best suited for an early detection, as we have already seen with rabies, for example. Also, early detection systems are um, are well applied for new diseases of unknown impact at the population level because it is the only way we have to actually detect new diseases. What are the elements of a good early detection surveillance system? Well, the basic elements that we have, we should first have an identification of the hazard 
that is, a knowledge of the epidemiology, the diagnosis and the prevention and control of the infection we are worried about, and of the different pathways and scenarios that would make the occurrence of the hazard possible. Obviously, this is only applicable for known diseases. Here, risk perception is very important, particularly if a risk assessment has not been previously performed. From risk sir, we strongly encourage that risk assessments are carried out to identify populations, times and places at higher risk of infection occurrence. And I will stress this later on in the presentation as well. Any surveillance system for infectious diseases is composed by a field and a laboratory detection um, system. And both field and laboratory early detection are influenced, very much influenced by the risk awareness derived from this risk perception and from the knowledge of the hazard, as well as by the, by the communication that happens between field, laboratory and decision makers. The analysis of um, data for detection purposes has increased over the last decades, particularly since the upsurge of new and emerging diseases worldwide. We will see also later on examples on this. For early detection purposes, both fields detection and data analysis detection constitute the suspicion of a disease, while confirmation is necessary in the laboratory. These components of surveillance that we have seen, field and laboratory detection, depend on a number of um, things that could speed or delay detection, and we will go over them. Laboratory detection, for example, depends first of all on the engagement to take and submit samples from the field. This is where field and laboratory um, detection join. But once this happens, actually, laboratory uh, detection is very, very quick. And nowadays, we have very good technology to actually um, detect pathogens very, very quickly, even from a few hours uh, from, from reception. Still, it is important that we ha have in mind that um, the sample characteristics will influence our laboratory detection because pathogens would replicate, would be excreted in more quantity if through some routes and through others, or would be maintained in the environment um, for longer in some samples than in others. Also, the transport and the conservation of the samples is going to influence the result, because sometimes uh, laboratories receive um, samples in a very poor conservation state. Uh, luckily, also technology has been applied in the last years to um, improve the way uh, samples are sent to, to the lab so that they continue to be um, adequate for diagnosis. Then there is the test characteristics for early detection. We want both a high sensitivity and a high specificity. And of course, the interpretation and communication of the results that uh, require some knowledge of the epidemiological situation and also some risk aware awareness of the situation regarding that particular pathogen. Now we will go through the elements of field detection. Um, components. So this one really is the most problematic one because it's where um, uh, we have found in the experiences over the last years that uh, most uh, errors and most delays are committed here at the field detection level. First of all, as with the laboratory detection, the most important is the recognition and engagement with the reporting system by field observers. And this is um, solved, of course, with the experience of having gone through a, um, a health alert or, or have, having seen or dealt with the disease in question. But if this has not happened because there has been a number of years without the infection, which is uh, the situation for many diseases um, nowadays, we could still um, perform training, um, and acquire this experience, at least uh, theoretically, through digital simulations and also through simulations in the field. And these are not fully implemented um, in all countries. And they do help a lot to, to get uh, yourself in the situation of what a health alert uh, could be like, because there's two things that uh, need to be corrected here. One is the experience in actually recognizing the disease, 
and the other one is the steps to follow um, uh, during an early detection, for example. Field detection also depends on the sampling design. Now, um, typical samplings are either active or passive surveillance. And we will see, uh, for example, what makes passive surveillance get delayed, get a delay in the, in the detection of an emerging disease. We have seen some of the, um, um, we have seen that training is very important and experience to recognize a disease, but also an infection may not be observed because the, um, the disease is subclinic or is not explosive. Uh, it's transmitted during the incubation period, so before the clinical signs are seen, or uh, it's masked by common infections that have lesions that are similar. Even if it was observed, the, uh, the field observer might not seek for a bit, contributing to late detection because he might uh, think uh, the signs he's seeing are not very severe, or he might decide to treat the, the clinical signs he's observing, and that makes the signs less severe uh, and also mask the, the real um, reason of, um, of the disease that is happening. Or he might be very experienced and he might just be scared of consequences and to not, to, to not seek for the vet for that reason. The vet as well could have an incorrect suspicion for the same uh, reasons, because he could uh, see that, um, that there is a concomitant infection, for example, and they get confused with that one, or and send maybe the samples to diagnose for that common infection instead for of the um, emerging disease. Um, here, risk perception is very important, because if there is a good risk awareness, at least he would have that in mind when he's seeing a common infection that is not um, healing well, it, it could at least um, be brought into his mind. More rarely, the official vet could think that um, it is not a notifiable disease, it does not qualify, uh, because he has no risk perfection, per, uh, perception or because the clinical signs are, are different uh, from what he has learned. So you can see that there are many, many steps that actually can delay um, a detection of emerging diseases in the field through passive surveillance. So this can be um, summarized actually in this very nice um, pyramid sample, a uh, pyramid diagram. If we have all animals here at the bottom of the pyramid, then we have animals that have the disease that are a few uh, that are less than, than all animals. The sick animals that are detected by farmer actually are even less. Those that are examined by the vet services get fewer animals that get sampled and so on until the ones that get diagnosed are here at the top of the, of the pyramid and as you can see they are generally very uh, few compared to the number of animals that are really detected. What we really want with early detection is to be able to detect as many samples as possible at the lowest uh, part of this uh, pyramid. Some ways that we have of improving passive surveillance for early detection. We have seen the uh, training that was very important and the acquiring the experience. Also, by increasing the number and distribution of observers that are trained, that are, have a continuous professional development, um, that uh, are aware of the risk, that inform information is disseminated to them, that there are platforms that allow this dissemination. This also um, insights over the better communication between field vet services and laboratories. To improve this communication of suspicion, it is very important to build trust between field and uh, vet services and the laboratory. And there are multiple ways of doing this, either through incentives for um, uh, notifying a suspicion, raising awareness, this dissemination of information we had talked about. For example, nowadays with the mobile apps, it's, um, easy to, to improve communication or through animal health platforms, training courses, etc. Also, a very good uh, outbreak communication, outbreak investigation, sorry, 
um, will help elucidate both uh, risk factors in the local situation where the outbreak is happening and will also um, imply all the actors that are involved in an outbreak investigation and also helps uh, to build this trust that is necessary. Communication is very, very important for early detection. Other ways of improving early suspicion in the field is uh, with the uh, availability, availability of rapid pen side tests. These have been developing uh, over the last years as well. For example, there is this uh, European Union project, Rapidia Field, where um, pen side tests have been developed uh, both for antigen and uh, antibody detection of uh, emerging diseases such as classical swine fever and African swine fever. And this will enormously help the uh, detection of a suspicion in the field. And it will also help to improve the communication between field observers and vets. Since they can immediately see a result, this works like a, um, like a pregnancy test. So you just need a very tiny drop of a sample, either saliva or blood or whatever, and you immediately see the result within minutes. So this, this can have a very positive um, uh, impact on identifying the a suspicion still for early detection purposes. It is still required a laboratory confirmation. Now we have seen some ways of improving um, um, passive surveillance design, but if we have an active surveillance design, um, we have ways of improving this as well for early detection purposes. Active surveillance designs sometimes are based on previous notifications or are based uh, on sensors. Now, if we had followed, uh, if we go back to a situation before 2014 when African swine fever was not still in the European Union countries, and we had gone to um, make an active sampling design based on sensors, we would probably have skipped uh, the Baltic countries that have later on been the most affected by um, African, that are at the moment the, uh, being affected by African swine fever, because we can see that in compare, compared with other countries, they hardly have any um, peak census. However, we can uh, apply a risk assessment schemes, um, like this one that I share here on the right, based on, uh, on, on publications that you have access to through the web links here, uh, that are based on the results of a release assessment through different routes of introduction for African swine fever. So on the top, there is a returning tracks, for example, and you can see that these uh, countries presented a high relative risk compared to others for that particular route, as well as with wild boar. So incorporating risk assessment and uh, uh, for, for the different routes of introduction does give more information than um, just a census-based um, design. Also, we have seen that field detection will depend on the infection dynamics. We have talked a little bit about it because it does have an impact on, on passive surveillance, but it does have an impact as well on active surveillance, and we do need to consider this. Um, generally, going again to African swine fever, a notification is, ha happens right here. That is, um, much later on than um, they, when the infection happened, while the virus excretion happens as, as early as 48 hours after the infection. So an animal that is found dead, for example, like at the moment, most of the surveillance for African swine fever in Europe is based on um, the finding of a, a dead wild boar, because they're apparently they're circulating more in wild boar than in domestic population. So it is based at the moment on the detection of dead wild boar. So what is happening is that probably, and then one, this is this wild boar is a, is one of the components. And when 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 this uh, the wild boar is found, then there is an a outbreak investigation and there is active sampling around that wild boar. Obviously, this is a bit late because probably this uh, wild boar has been excreting virus all of these days before it has been found dead. And most probably the infection is not there anymore. Is what um, 
cipher um, called the iceberg concept of disease. That de detection happens here after severe disease or death, but we are missing this bottom of the pyramid as well, where the uh, pathogen might be ex excreted. For new diseases, the only uh, mechanism we had um, a, a few years ago was to look for unusual or massive mortalities of an infectious nature, look for clusters of these unusual or massive mortalities. But is this early? I mean, it doesn't look very early if you are already finding uh, the dead uh, animals, because as, as we have just seen, it could have been happening that the transmission happened before they showed any clinical signs. We will see some um, improvements to to this kind of, uh, to detect new uh, diseases uh, later on in the presentation. As I had mentioned, the um, what we are looking at uh, for early detection, what we are really interested in is in maximizing the probability of detection with the sampling design. And how can we do this? Well, our aim is to detect all cases to maximize the case detection probability, that is the sensitivity, but we want to do this um, at the, the most reduced uh, cost, either in terms of logistics, resources, or time. And we have a tool, uh, which is the cost effectiveness analysis, to actually find out, a, to choose the best option of the options we have with the same aim, which is to detect, to maximize this case probability or uh, detection probability, um, to see which option with this same aim uh, actually is costing less. And this has been explained uh, or will be explained in the um, online uh, trainings uh, developed for RISCSER as well on evaluation and economics. So an improvement of the passive surveillance detection of, for example, um, new diseases, as we were telling before, is uh, through syndromic surveillance. Syndromic surveillance is a type of um, data analysis detection that uses multiple sources of data that are indicators of clinical signs or risk factors. So, for example, it can take data from uh, climate data, laboratory results, uh, slaughterhouse seizures, mortality data, etc. And all this data is processed um, in a computer. The data is analyzed and interpreted, and the uh, ultimate uh, aim is to establish thresholds um, to detect when an alarm could be set off, could indicate that there is a, a detection of some new disease happening there. So, um, syndromic surveillance has a developed a, a lot in the last years, but it's not yet fully implemented at the government level. So this is still um, in its early stages, but it definitely will be a low cost option because uh, what is really needed is the, is, is the cost of analyzing and processing this data. An example of this data analysis detection, for example, there, there are many um, examples in the literature I have chosen this one that was uh, monitoring and uh, forecasting with Wikipedia the occurrence of a um, global disease and they actually were able to fit um, a model to the observations of a uh, dengue and influenza and tuberculosis in different countries so they explored uh, different diseases in different locations and actually, this works, and uh, uh, this probably has a lot of future in those places where internet is being used actively, because um, when there, whenever uh, uh, people hear about an alarm, about, about any health event, they normally go onto the internet and look for it, and look what's going on. So if we are able to actually search, what to actually um, analyze what people are searching, we might be able to find trends of what's going on. And this is um, a current uh, research field that is um, that is being developed very quickly.
Another low-cost option for early detection through data analysis is to improve field detection by increasing active and passive surveillance efforts in those areas, time periods, or population at higher risk of exposure. So based on the OIE Entry Risk Assessment Framework, we can identify these times and populations and uh, areas at high risk by assessing, first of all, the distribution and extent of the infection at the source. This we can do by analyzing outbreak data as well as risk factor data. Then we can assess the probability of infection until destination, for example, through spatial or through temporal spread. And finally, we can assess the consequences of destination. And we can predict the, the probability of exposure to the different routes of infection. So as you can see, this framework starts off with this identification of the risk pathways for the entry of a pathogen, which is equivalent to the hazard identification we had already seen before in this uh, diagram that I had uh, mentioned as the uh, key elements for a good surveillance system for early detection. This approach is very frequently being used, much more than data analysis detection. And for example, in the European Union, um, the European Food Safety Authority, the EFSA, performs many risk assessments based on this type of approach. Also for some infectious diseases like uh, particularly Blue Tongue or West Nile Fever, but also for avian influenza, at least the assessment on the risk of exposure has been used to select species and populations for active sampling and also for raising awareness for passive surveillance. There are also many examples in the scientific literature based on this approach. I have um, selected this one I'm very familiar with, applied to the surveillance of avian influenza in wild birds in Spain. Based on the outbreaks of highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 in wild birds in Europe between 2005 and 2007. What happened at the time was that a active sampling of wild birds was compulsory and the European Union had given some very useful recommendations on the time periods, the locations and the bird species to target based on the risk-based analysis performed by the EFSA. But still, for each individual country, the risk of a highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 introduction by wild birds did vary because countries were located at very different distances from uh, areas that are that were infected and also they had different uh, wild bird populations and they received different uh, number of wild bird populations from these areas that had been infected. So the probability that an infected wild bird reached Spain was calculated by multiplying the probability of infection at origin, which was based not only on notification but also on the risk factors for infection, that is this um, PI, and also on the probability that an infected bird remained infectious during transit. That is this PR here. And in here we considered, well, different uh, things, um, like the uh, different uh, flight behavior of the different species, the time between band ringing and recoveries to take into consideration the time of excretion of the virus, etc. Once we calculated this probability that a, an infected bird reached Sp uh, Spain, this P PE, we estimated a relative risk. Uh, that was the probability that an infected bird reach a, a Spain relative to the lowest value. And we calculated this for all administrative units. So with this, we could already uh, find out what would be the number of wild birds to sample if sampling had been risk-based. We, we transformed this relative risk into this uh, number and we compared it with the observed sampling. This is what really happened, how, how sampling was performed um, in Spain in wild birds and this is how a risk-based uh, sampling would look like. Now, uh, this type of sampling, this risk-based sampling would have helped not only for active wild bird sampling, which, which uh, stopped uh, very soon after to be compulsory, but also for active sampling of poultry farms that were located at high risk of wild bird infection, as shown in this map. The only um, outbreaks that Spain had were these two, 
bigger ones in green, in green, sorry, in the north of Spain and in the center, which are both located in areas at high risk of wild dog infection. And the most probable source of this, uh, this was uh, the, the one in the north was a wild bird, and the one in the center was a domestic um, hen layer farm, which was located uh, just three kilometers away from a water pot with the uh, wild birds, which was um, identified as the possible um, origin uh, source of infection, as there was no other route of infection involved. But to improve this active and passive surveillance, um, design and evaluation for early detection, we do need the good data. We, could, we, need, we need good data and we need good analysis as well of the surveillance data. And there are many epidemiological tools to describe and analyze the trends and the patterns of disease and risk factor probability of occurrence, both in space and time. Some of the factors that we would like to consider are described in this diagram, in this typical epidemiological diagram. So we want to identify uh, factors that are related to the host, like the change in immunity, the change in contact patterns, related to the pathogen, like the change in genetics or uh, an improved laboratory detection, the change in environment, through decreased biosecurity, a change in management, ecological change, climate change, etc. And we can analyze this in a descriptive way or in an analytic way through this um, um, through these many tools that exist uh, currently, particularly well regression models, cost of analysis, other spatial and temporal analysis, etc. Et but as I stressed before, we do need good data. Good data um, to take into account our historic prevalence, to take to be able to classify our animal holdings by risk factors, such as biosecurity, movements, proximity to wild animal reservoirs, etc. And I mean, any data is better than no data at all, but obviously the results of our analysis will be more accurate as the quality of the input data is better. These methods have been uh, reviewed in an article that was published under the Risk Cell Framework by Rodriguez Pietro et al., the systematic review of surveillance systems and methods for early detection of exotic new and re-emerging diseases in animal populations, which you also have the link here in the web link. Uh, Box. Uh, these tools help to visualize and analyze surveillance results, also help to design or redesign sampling sites. They also set up alarms and they help evaluate the design choices for cost sensitivity and timeliness. Some of these tools, uh, we have uh, mentioned a few in the presentation, like the risk assessment, the training simulations, etc. But there are many others that are already described. And although um, they are a research on this on these data analysis techniques is still ongoing to make them more friendly user, etc. But there are plenty of methods that are available already and that will contribute to an improved early detection surveillance. Another example that I wanted to bring to you uh, that combines different uh, surveillance components to offer a most a more cost-effective design is to choose, for example, a, um, a Sentinel site based on this data analysis design, so based on, on, on a risk assessment where we would uh, be choosing uh, Sentinels that are uh, at high risk of exposure, where it's more probably that we detect a, a disease early, and then to combine it with a continuous 24-hour syndrome surveillance um, design uh, where we would be obtaining uh, data in real time. And this would offer a, a cheaper system than having to sample the Sentinel sites, uh, like it is being done at the moment, which is every 15, 30 days, go, um, go taking a blood sample and the, with, with the cost that that, that uh, implies and the number of negatives uh, that are probably found, which uh, discourage uh, further sampling, etc. So the idea would be to perform first a risk assessment of the exposure with good data and to identify those areas at higher risk of uh, infection. For example, uh, in this example, it would be those that are 
uh, colored in red would be at higher risk, and those colored in blue would be at lower risk. So according to this, we could then plan and say, okay, those areas at higher risk are going to uh, receive a higher surveillance sampling intensity. And how we can do this? Through, for example, sentinel surveillance. But as I told you, instead of doing this sampling, uh, sentinel sampling, every 15, 13 days, let's implement a system where we could uh, sample uh, data in real time at high risk periods. And how can we do this? Well, uh, under Rapid Field the project as well, uh, we tested a, a method um, to sample in real time sentinel herds and sentinel peaks through, for example, um, video camera monitoring and also through the insertion of microchips that would uh, monitor motion and temperature. This way we could um, find when did uh, the onset of infection happen because there was a decreased uh, movement of the animals, there was a decreased motion in the individual animals and there was an increase in the temperature indicating fever. And we actually detected this change even before the pathogen was detected through blood sampling. So this offers a very, very interesting uh, way of early detection where already animals could be uh, quarantined when one of these alarms is set up. For example, uh, normally it's, it's uh, first the, the decreased uh, movement, which is also easier to, to monitor through a camera. So, uh, one could already set an alarm when the decreased movement uh, happens and then uh, go to the next phase which would be taking temperature. If both decreased movement and uh, rising temperature happen, then that uh, animal could be quarantined, or those animals could be quarantined until the vet comes and performs a, a pen side test or takes samples for laboratory diagnosis or also. Uh, so just to finish and to conclude, uh, we have seen many tools and many systems that we have of improving uh, surveillance for early detection that could be translated in a management uh, point of view through epidemiological observatories that could be dedicated to uh, this kind of activities, surveillance, communication, outbreak investigation, spatial temporal analysis, database integration, syndrome surveillance, risk analysis, cost effectiveness analysis, etc. And these are implemented in some countries, but I think they still need to be um, much more widely uh, implemented. This is all for today. I hope you have enjoyed this lecture and I am happy to take any queries on the email that is stated here. Goodbye.